wherever. Sorry, sit wherever you feel like. There's no, no balance um, issues here. Uh, okay, so welcome back everybody to the EU Reality Check. Um, my name is Laura Shields from British in Europe, and this is a very quick temperature check of what the mood is like in Europe at the moment, because we spend a lot of the time discussing the benefits um, and also an awful lot of time discussing the UK's issues. But actually, we need to probably pour a little bit of cold water uh, into some of this discussion. And I'm very pleased to welcome Charles Grant, who is the director of the very esteemed think tank, the Centre for European Reform, Mary Honeyball, Labour MEP, Anatole Koletsky, journalist and financial commentator, and Alan Smith, uh, the, an SNP MEP. So thank you all. I think we can probably all agree that the UK hasn't exactly covered itself in glory in the negotiations with the rest of the EU27. So Alan and Mary, I'm just looking at some of the language that I've written down here, most of it from Boris Johnson, when he was Foreign Secretary. Punishment beatings, going to whistle for the money, more recently, Jeremy, State, Jeremy Hunt comparing the EU to the USSR. <laughs> Do your colleagues really want us to stay, or are they just fed up and want us out? Well. They, I don't think they do want us out. I mean, our colleagues, other countries in the EU, are actually very tolerant of Britain. They've given us all sorts of concessions, like we're not in the Euro, we're not in the Schengen Agreement. And they, they genuinely, I think, are puzzled about why Britain took the decision to leave. They just don't understand it. And what we never seem to quite get in this country is that... The countries in the EU actually like the EU. They see it as a positive for them, and they can't get why another country wants to leave. So it's not starting from a good place. But the negotiations themselves, from my perspective, and I was actually in a meeting with Michel Barnier yesterday, is that the EU is being very straight about it. They're being very calm and measured. They, their view is it's the UK that wants to leave, so the UK has to come up with the answers. And they know that this government has made the three red lines, no single market, no customs union, no ECJ. So the EU has had this massive task of trying to come to some sort of arrangement which honours those red lines, and the deal that we have is that one. And that's what they've set out to do. And Michel Barnier has been on record as saying that I want to facilitate the UK leaving the EU and I want to do the best I can and I do think that that's what the EU has done. Um, so I think this Boris Johnson nonsense is exactly that, it's nonsense, that's not how they view us. They're sad about us going, they actually do see us in many ways as an asset. We're a big member state with still a strong economy which has brought a lot to the EU, um, and we mustn't forget that. It's not a one-way street. We do contribute as well. And in terms of our, our parliamentary colleagues in the European Parliament, it's been absolutely civilised. There's been no repercussions at all. We're still there doing our jobs, treated as if we're still doing our jobs. Um, so the atmosphere is, is sad. They don't want us to go, but it's good and it's civilised. Alan. Yeah, I'd agree with all of that. Uh, and I'd, I'd also like to put on the record why an SNP politician is here today with you. That's because we have a common agenda to stop Brexit. Now, from a Scottish perspective, we voted very clearly. <laughs> from a Scottish perspective, we voted very clearly because I think Scotland has a different sense of our place in the world and where we fit. We have a different style of politics because we have proportional representation at every level of government rather than first past the post. We have a different sense of this stuff. But I don't want to see, and I do not believe there is anything good for an independent Scotland in Brexit. And I don't want to see your closest friends and neighbours have a bad time. So we have a common agenda to stop this, and then we can come back to accountability and transparency and the, all the issues that have been talked about, about broken democracy. I, there are a lot of things that need to be done that Brexit was presented as the answer to when actually it will exacerbate all the problems. So let's stop, let, let's deal with the first thing that we've got to deal with, and that's stopping Brexit. And, in terms of how other EU states and our, our MEP colleagues are viewing us, there has been a deliberate attempt on the part of some UK politicians, commentators, to poison the well. To poison the well with the idea that, well, you want rid of us, you do want rid of us. Nigel Farage has been trying that all the time. He, he is not a rude person, but when he's making a gratuitously offensive speech, he's looking for a reaction because he wants the UK to be perceived like this. 
So I'm very proud to be part of a cross-party group with Mary and others that we are there at the other end of that saying, no, we are constructive, we do want to be part of this. And the UK within the EU is not hated, is not disliked, is not a victim. Actually, the UK has been pretty successful in getting things done. And from a Scottish perspective, I think Scotland could be doing better if we emulated how the Irish do things, but that's another discussion. So in terms of how our, our, our colleagues are looking at us, there is a real pragmatism about we don't want the UK to leave. I have to say that is evolving, and as we look towards the EU elections coming up, that electoral calculus is changing given that another, a number of our MEP colleagues are looking at our seats with salivation in that it changes their electoral calculus. And we need to be sensitive that this discussion is not happening in a vacuum. We will not decide this in isolation within the UK or at home, however you define home or the nation, however you define that. We will need to do that in conjunction with respectfully the interests of the EU27 and that's where we really have been instrumental in changing that balance. Thank you. Charles, um, assuming, let's go for a hypothetical situation, just say that Parliament ends up going for a, a referendum, a re ratify or remain referendum. Um, and assuming that Article 50 can be extended in time to have one, what would be the sort of legal obligations and the political attitude of the other member states? I mean, obviously, I appreciate you can't go through all 27, mm. but how, are they, how would they view that? Well, uh, of course, an extension of Article 50 does require unanimity on the EU That's side. Why I said as far as I'm aware, they all say yes. Not everybody on the EU side is equally enthusiastic about keeping the Brits in. Those who are more federalist in their bent, those who are more sympathetic to Russia, as one or two are, those who are less Atlanticist, those who uh, are less committed to free trade, have some reservations about the Brits, but most of them don't, and most everybody would, would agree to keep us in. And of course, uh, the extending Article 50, they would extend it to allow us to have a referendum, if that's what we want to do, not just to allow the Tory party to work out what its policy on Europe is. If it's a frivolous extension, they'd say no. If it's a serious extension for an election or referendum, they would say yes. Thank you. Um, Anatole, 2015, 2016, where the timing of the referendum was so bad because we'd had the migration crisis, uh, there, was, there were terror attacks across Europe. Uh, it was just a really, really difficult um, year for Europe. The UK looks wildly different from it did in 2016. What does Europe look like now? What would, you, what would the UK be trying to remain in if we tried to stop Brexit at the ballot box? Well, I'd like to take it maybe a year ahead from now. Uh, I think economically, and this may surprise you, the EU will look much stronger than it did in 2016 relative to Britain. It may have weakened somewhat, but relative to Britain. Uh, and there are two broad reasons why the EU is going to outperform the British economy very significantly over the next few years. Uh, first of all, because the UK is to a large extent a production platform for Europe. The only reason the Japanese car manufacturers are in Britain is to produce cars for Europe. Uh, the same is true at the less visible level throughout the manufacturing sector. So if Britain is not in the EU, the economy will be very significantly weaker. Looking further ahead, uh, even the service sector, even London, is going to be much weaker than the European service sector. Why? Because although under, as things stand at the moment, a lot of the activity that is done now will continue to be done for a few years, the rules will change over time. They will change to the detriment of the UK. And this, I think, will become, is already becoming obvious and will become increasingly obvious over the next six months. The reason they'll change will not be because the Europeans are trying to impose punishment beatings or anything else, but because the current rules have been designed by the UK as part of the single market program, which, let's not forget, was a Thatcherite British conspiracy against the rest of Europe to benefit Britain at the expense of Germany, France, Italy, and all the others, they accepted it. Now, what's the evidence? I'd like to just explain to you why I'm so confident that despite all the bad news you read about Italy and France, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, the European economies will look much stronger uh, in the next few years than the British economy. And again, there are two reasons for that. Partly, the forecasts of Project Fear, 
have actually turned out to be right. They have not turned out to be wrong. What do I mean by that? You may remember the most prominent forecast for project fear was that every household in Britain would be 4,500 uh, pounds worse off as a result of Brexit. This has been ridiculed and poo-pooed. That forecast has turned out to be uncannily right. Why? We're not 4,500 worse off now. What that said was after 15 years of Brexit, the UK economy would be 7.5% to 8% smaller than it otherwise would be. After 15 years. Now think about that, what that means per year. Half a percent a year. This is exactly the degree to which the economy has underperformed already before Brexit has even happened. So first of all, the forecasts of the future look uncannily right. Secondly, even more importantly, looking back at history. Before Britain joined the common market, some of you like me are old enough to remember that period, Britain was the weakest economy in Europe. It was the sick man of Europe, sick man of the world, universally recognized until 1973. Once we joined the common market, Britain became a middling economy within Europe. From 1993 onwards, Britain became the strongest economy, not just in Europe, but all over the world. In the 25 years from 1993 to 2017, the UK had the highest growth of national income per head, not only in Europe, but in all the G7 countries. Better than the US, better than Canada, better than Germany and France. That was no coincidence. 1993 was the beginning of the single market program and was also the point at which Britain detached itself from the European exchange rate mechanism, as, you may, as, as it was called at the time. You may remember the day so-called, that was called Black Wednesday at the time. I was writing at the Times, I was economics editor of the Times. The very next day, I said, this is not Black Wednesday, this is White Wednesday. This is when Britain frees itself of the biggest single mistake that the Europeans are making, which is the single currency. So for 25 years, Britain was in the extraordinary position from 1993 of 2017 of being able to have our cake and eat it. We have now thrown away that cake. And just final point, just the reality to check of statistics. What does that mean? Over that 25-year period, the UK outperformed the rest of the world to such a degree that relative to the US, our national income per head was 3.5% higher over 25 years than it otherwise would be. Relative to Germany, it was 10% higher. Relative to France, it was 16% higher. Now, these are percentages, they don't mean anything. Let me give you an emotional me meaning of that. 3.5%, the, the degree to which Britain in the single market outperformed the U US is equivalent to 80 billion pounds. That's 2,000 pounds per head per household, 1.5 billion per week extra for the NHS if we wanted to spend it. But wait for this, wait for this. Relative to France, we outperformed by 16%. That's equivalent to 368 billion pounds. That's not just a few that millions extra for the, G, for, for, for the NHS. That is double the entire budget of the NHS. That is what we stand to lose as a result of being not just outside Europe, but outside the single market uh, and losing this extraordinary benefit that we've had uh, over the last 25 years. Double the entire budget of the NHS. Thank you. That's a pretty good figure to stick with. Thank you, Anatole. I'm just looking at time, um, and we are, I know that our next panel is coming up in about five to ten minutes, so I'm going to ask you to, if you could, for your next answer, just be a little more succinct, because I'd like to get the audience in where possible. Alan, if we get to the point where we do have a referendum, we could conceivably be campaigning for a referendum, and you'd have to fight European elections, because we'd have, you know, that's the, that's the, the rules. How on earth could we do that? I think there's a range of possible answers, and she asked for a, a, a succinct answer to, 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 to that one. I'll do my best. Uh, there's a range of ways in which a requirement for representation under the treaties in the European Parliament could be fulfilled. 
And there is, and again, this is my point about this isn't happening in isolation. Everybody else will be fighting a European election. Does Ireland get the two seats that the UK has allocated to it if Brexit happens, or do they not? That is not something to which there is yet an answer. I think there needs to be an answer, and there was an interesting paper out yesterday that put a couple of scenarios out there. I think we need to be very clear that this cannot be wished away. And one of the problems that we've seen with Brexit is people saying that complicated things can be dealt with really straightforward. There is going to be an issue where we will need to have an answer about what we do with the European elections. We do need to make sure that there's UK representation so long as the UK remains part of the EU. How we do that, I think, is an open question. Thank you. Mary, one of the big challenges um, that constantly gets highlighted about uh, Europe as well is the rise of right-wing strongmen, so Salvini in uh, Italy, uh, Orban in Hungary, of course, there's the Polish government as well, and in recent weeks we've been hearing about the sort of Italian-Polish pact to try and reform Italy, I mean, reform Europe in, in that kind of identity. But the other big story in Europe that isn't reported so much is more fragmentation rather than populism. And if you look at someone like, in places like Germany, Belgium, Benelux, the green movement is also doing very well. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and what that could mean for the balance of power in the European Parliament. And are we going to see a wave of women being elected into the European Parliament this year in the way that we have in Congress in the US? Well, well f first of all, of course, the, the difference between elections to the European Parliament and anywhere else is that you're not looking at forming a government, um, you're not even looking at, at some sort of legislature in your own area. It is a European movement and that I think means that people vote differently. So what we've always seen is a number of parties, I mean, even from the UK, and of course we are elected on proportional representation, which helps that. Um, so so it's, a, it's a very different parliament anyway, before we start with any of that. But of course, I mean, you talked about the rise of populism. We are seeing um, a, a, quite a, a significant increase in the hard right. I mean, in Germany, um, the... AFD, the Alternative for Deutschland, actually gained more in the recent elections, more votes than, than my sister party, the Social Democrats. Um, we've got Gert Wilders in Holland. Um, there's even hard right parties in, in the Nordic countries in Sweden and Denmark. So it is happening in Europe, um, not to mention Salvini, who you did mention, and it's North and South Europe, and of course, Hungary and Poland are a lot further down this route with governments of that persuasion. So I think we need to be extremely concerned about this. And it's something that is even happening in, in, in this country. I mean, depending on how you view UKIP, I mean, they are on the fringes of that, to put it mildly. And we have actually had National Front members before, British National Party members before. So the UK is not exempt from this. And I think it's something which all of us as Democrats, as people who believe in Europe, believe in international cooperation, need to address and need to think very hard about why is this happening? Why is this happening in the richest part of the world? Why are people turning to these sort of movements and turning away from the political systems which have worked for them for what, 70 years or so? And it's hard questions and it's very hard, I think, for us who are representatives to get to grips with this, why it's taking place, but it is happening in the EU, and the EU at the moment actually does have some powers to deal with national governments that they think really are acting in a way that's not acceptable. It's Article 7 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the EU, which does allow the EU to take action to put sanctions on countries who they think are not carrying out the values of the EU. And they are starting to look at that with Orban in Hungary. So there are processes for doing this in the EU, which it would be a real tragedy, I think, if we lost them. But it's absolutely not the way to do it. We need to see what values people have. We were talking about values. What views, what beliefs, why their lives are such that they feel that they need to vote in this way. And I think it's a hard question for all of us, for all of us as Democrats. And as, as a Labour representative, I think it's particularly hard for us as Social Democrats because the Social Democrats are very much suffering under this. And I'm not sure we've worked out quite why yet. Um, in terms of values, I mean, one of the 
fundamental values of the EU has actually been equality and gender equality, which was written, in fact, into the original Treaty of Rome. We've always actually had good representation for women in, in the European Parliament. It's about 35% now, which is hugely better than the representation in the House of Commons, which is somewhere about 25%. So there are things, there are very valuable things which the EU has and upholds, as we all know, and it's one of the reasons that we so much want to keep our membership. Um, and so it's, it's worrying, and we need, to, we need to deal with this. And the, the way to deal with these, these far-right movements is is democratically. Um, it's no good saying, you know, we don't agree with them, we're not going to engage with them. We've got to work out why, and we've got to put forward our alternatives to them. And one of those alternatives obviously has to be for Britain to stay in the European Union. <laughs> Thank you. Charles and Anatole, I'm just going to ask you one final question, then we'll take a couple from the audience. Charles. Um, if there is a referendum campaign, so I'm keeping asking you to be hypothetical, there's a lot of talk about how any campaign to keep the UK in the EU should, should say something like remain and reform, you know, this idea that we should stay in and make the EU better. How do you think that would be viewed in uh, the EU27 and Brussels? And how should a remaining UK behave? Should they sit on the naughty step and be quiet for a bit? <laughs> or should we be getting in there and def aggressively defending our interests in the way that apparently we haven't been so good at doing? Remain and reform be going on very badly with our friends in yeah, Brussels. Yeah. Uh, I'm afraid that, you know, they, they'd love to stick, keep us in, but not to the extent of changing the way they operate, the way they like to operate. There's a, there's a misunderstanding amongst many, many British politicians, like Nick Clegg and Tony Blair, who say they all want to restrict free movement, so they're going to let us restrict free movement too. No, they don't. Mainstream European politicians do not want to restrict internal movement within the EU. They do want to restrict people coming in from outside. That's a different thing, and British politicians get that muddled because we don't like Polish plumbers. They think everybody doesn't like them. That's really not the case. So we're not going to get an emergency broker migration. If we want to rejoin the EU or stay in the EU, it'll be on the same terms we have today. And our EU friends will point out, rightly, it's a very good deal. We have our cake and eat it. As Mary said, in the, not in the euro if you don't want to be, not in the Schengen if you don't want to be, not in the JHA if you don't want to be. That's, and the, what they will say for us is we can, we can have war words. On your other question, yes, the naughty step. For quite a while, British soft power, British influence, British, the respect for Britain has been so damaged by the Brexit process, by the ignorant and aggressive and stupid comments of our political leaders that we need to, instead of going, going back into Brussels and saying, well, we're going to change the way things work, we need to be a bit humble and a bit modest and just, and just polite and get on with our partners. Yeah. All right. Anatole, I'm going to ask you one very quick thing, and then we're going to be able to take one question. I'm sorry, this is a very, very short panel. Um, Anatole, wait, we had 25 minutes, I'm sorry. Well, okay. Yeah, you're right. Okay, we'll take one from the floor then. I'll skip mine. I'll take the lady there, thank you. Lady in the red jumper, yes. So, um, what effect do you think that climate change is having on these questions, especially in relation to the rise of the right? I watched a film recently by Michael Nash called Climate Refugee, came out 10 years ago, full of um, predictions for 10 years after, in other words, today. A huge rise in refugees from Africa and Asia. Can we understand the rise of the right? I mean, refugees who are fleeing from the catastrophe that the climate change has caused, i.e. our economic benefits, our way of living, causing those problems. Um, can we understand the rise of the right in relation to that? That's what I really want you to address. That's the impact of climate refugees. Okay, all right, and I'll take one from that gentleman there. Yes, you, sir. We... we we need you to wait for the microphone. Thank you. Mr. Kaletsky, you wrote a book called Capitalism 4.0. Maybe you should write, if you think so, a book called Democracy 4.0 to show how we move from a centralized democracy like the UK to a multi-level system of governance that addresses local, regional, national, European, and maybe even transatlantic institutions working together democratically and efficiently. Do you think that's really what is at the heart of the Brexit issue and it should be addressed across Europe and not just in Britain? Do you want to take that one first? Uh, and yeah, then... Well, well I, I can answer uh, very quickly. Uh, uh, I'll write another book if you promise to buy it. Uh, uh, no, but, but I think that 
what we're seeing uh, all over Europe is related to the breakdown of the version of the capitalist system that came to a head in the crisis of 2007 and 2008, which is what my original book was about. And I think what that leads to is a breakdown in some of the democratic and political institutions. That's what we are living through, just as we lived in similar breakdowns in the 1970s, the 1920s and 30s. So I think there is an element of truth in that, but I don't think that's the main driving force of Brexit. The main driving force of Brexit is the uh, false image that was projected about Europe's responsibility for all the troubles that we have in this country, which has been the theme of, of this conference. And that's why I think throwing things like climate change into it and so on is actually a distraction. We've got to focus on what this country has been doing wrong rather than what Europe has been doing to us. And that's why I also fully agree with Charles that the idea that we campaign for a Europe that is reformed in our image would be a very bad mistake. We've got to present a positive image of Europe, not of something that we are going to fix for them. Okay. Does anybody want to take the point about climate refugees, the rise of the right? Yes. Well, one point on climate. I mean, I think the rise of the populist right in Europe has had three unpleasant or difficult consequences. One of them is that uh, climate change has moved down the agenda. Look at the, the Gilets Jaunes protests in France are largely against Macron's attempt to put fuel duty up because of climate, because Gilets Jaunes people, many French voters, don't care about climate. The second, the second and most unfortunate consequence of the rise of the far right is that centre-right parties, look at Austria, have become semi-far right in their attitude to immigration and other things. The, the moderate right is becoming far right. And the third consequence is European integration, the old form of new treaties transferring powers to EU institutions, is basically dead because any new treaty treaty would require referendums in four or five countries, and we all know what the result would be. So there are many unfortunate consequences of the rise of the far right, but climate change moving down the agenda seems to be one of them that's unfortunate. Thank you. I'm going to take one more question. There's a lady there. Yes. Uh, I assume that Anatole Kaletsky's um, figures just now are correct. I've got, I'm sure they are. Um, a how can we get the BBC to put forward what is the, the reality? And, and B, does Mr. Kaletsky agree that the problem, therefore, which led possibly to Brexit, is that those fruits, that wealth was not shared properly? Uh, sorry, that, that, that's directed to me. I hope you... Uh, very quick, I think one of the best ideas that I've heard uh, so far today was the idea in the previous uh, session that everybody should write to the BBC after every, every time they compare, uh, they give equal weight to those who argue that the earth is round and those who argue that the earth is flat. I mean, that is basically what the BBC is doing. Uh, and on the point about the, the sharing of wealth, that's absolutely right. I mean, the figures that I gave shows what Britain could have done over the last 25 years with the enormous wealth that was generated during that golden period of having our cake and eat it. Britain failed to do that, and they failed to do that not because of European politicians, but because of our own politicians and, frankly, our own electorates voting for politicians who failed to do it. So the responsibility is right here. It's not over there. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. We do have a flashing Time's Up sign, but I'm going to take... If anyone has a question for Mary or Alan, I'm going to take one, and then we're going to wrap up. So, yes, gentlemen there. If you could keep it focused, that would be great. Yes. But is it for Mary or Alan? Oh, who's it for? Uh, Mary. Oh. We haven't talked about the, the EU army, which will come up in any second referendum. Um, we know that our opponents will say, we told you there's going to be an EU army, and now there is. How do we deal with that? Shouldn't we have a common European defence identity? Hang on, was the question, how do we deal with the question of the EU army, or should we be having one? Uh, how do we deal with the, with, the, uh, with the rhetoric of, there's an EU army coming? Okay. Uh, Sorry, I still don't... So the question is, when they, when they come up saying there's an EU ar army coming, how do we deal with it? Well, presumably it's the question about veto. Well, I, there's, there's, 
there's a lot of fear in this country around this whole question of an EU army, um, and I don't think it's actually very helpful to put it in those terms. Um, the, the, the common security and defence policy is actually what it says. It's about security, and it's actually not an aggressive force. So I think we just need to be clear about this, and we actually, Britain is one of the major contributors to it. We have been one of the, the leading nation, the leading member states in this whole question of, of foreign affairs and security by the EU. And actually, another part of, the, of Brexit, if it happens, which we hope it won't, is that Europe will lose that input, which has actually been very valuable and which has been very good for this country. So the, at the moment, the, the EU common security policy is essentially, but not totally, obviously, a British policy. And it would be quite, I mean, it wouldn't help anyone if that were to go. So I think we just need to hang on to that. It appears that in the negotiations for the deal which probably won't ever go through Parliament, so it's a bit academic, that actually security cooperation was part of that and was agreed that that might be something that would continue post-Brexit. Um, so that's a recognition that, of the importance that the EU places on this. We also have had reports in the press that there is an increasing cooperation, if you like, between France and Germany and discussions about a security force that's probably there, but I think it's too early to start talking about that in any great detail or depth because we just don't know where that's going. I mean, I think my own view is that if we want to avoid this and we want to continue with a good, sound, positive defence and security policy for the EU, we need to stay there. Britain really needs that, to be there to give that stability. Thank you. Alan, could you also just clarify, I mean, isn't this the question of the EU army, though, a sovereignty issue? I mean, it's a, it would have to be quite, um, unanimous. Sure. I, I think the gentleman it's raises not. a wider wait, point wait. as well, and it, it would be adv good advice for all of us. Don't let the opposition set the terms of the discussion. Yeah. Yeah. On any of them. I am... Um, I am, the SNP is an internationalist party. We, we, were, we are relaxed about defence cooperation. We already do it in lots of different scenarios. We're, we're in favor of NATO membership, which is one structure in which we can do that. We are a country which is part of a state that is presently procuring uh, uh, aircraft carriers with no planes. We need defense cooperation to actually do anything useful in the world. As a block of 500 million people, it's defense and security cooperation. It is not an EU army. And there is no question whatsoever that the soldier, soldiers, men and women, will be under the democratic control of the sovereign member states of the European Union, those that wish to cooperate and those that don't. So the, the, the discussion about an EU army actually accepts the idea that somebody will be sitting in Brussels moving tanks around on a map and we'll have nothing to do with it. Don't accept their false premise. Because right. if you accept that false premise, you've lost. Very important point. Thank you. And I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there because I can see that the next panel is ready to go. So I'd like to thank Charles Grant, Mary Honeyball, Anatole Koletsky and Alan Smith. Thank you to the audience for questions and comments.